Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our COSE Convention webinar series number two. We are excited to bring you the COSE Convention in a virtual format this year. My name is Tom Florian, and on behalf of the Iowa High School Speech Association, welcome to today's presentation. I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we introduce our panelists and speakers for today's webinar. The first thing is that the chat has been disabled for today's webinar, but we encourage you to utilize the Q&A function uh, of the webinar. So that's at the bottom of your screen. There's a button that says Q&A. Be sure to use that to submit your questions during the presentation. We'll be able to answer those throughout the webinar. There's also the raise hand function that you might utilize uh, during audience participation at select times as well. So those are the two functions of the webinar to be familiar with today the Q&A and the raise hand function. This webinar is also being recorded and it will be posted to the Iowa High School Speech Association website, uh, hopefully later this week, if not next week, so you can review it at a later time if you would like. So those are the housekeeping items. Once again, thank you for being with us. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the executive director of the Iowa High School Speech Association, Craig Enan. Thanks, Tom. It is great to have you all here. I'm excited to be part of our coaches convention and we are thrilled with the people that we have here today to talk about storytelling and self-help. Two amazing sessions. And first of all, we're going to talk about storytelling and the two individuals that are going to be dealing with storytelling for us are Robin Crow and Darren Crow. Robin is the speech coach at Cedar Valley Christian. She's also been a district officer, and she has run IE speech contests. Darren Crow is a professional storyteller who's very famous all through Eastern Iowa. And this is a wonderful husband and wife team. And I'm thrilled to introduce the Crows right now. Darren and Robin, take it away. Hi, thank you, Craig. That was, I have to live up to that now. <laughs> Yikes. Um, hi, everybody. We are really sad we don't get to see you in person, but um, hello from Eastern Iowa, from Cedar Rapids. We miss you all. We hope we'll get to see you in person sometime soon. And in the meanwhile, we're here to talk to you today about storytelling in the time of COVID. So I'll share my little screen with you. So here we are, storytelling in the time of COVID <laughs> with Darren and Robin. So today we're going to talk to you about three things having to do with storytelling. So here's our outline. The first thing we want to talk with you about is personal stories and Darren will really talk quite a bit about that. Um, so getting away from telling folk tales and fairy tales and children's books and more into telling personal stories. Um, and boy, in this year, we all have a lot of personal stories. So that's our first topic. Our second topic will be movement. Um, I tried to, you know, say something like movement on the stool, but that didn't sound very good. And then I tried movement when you can't move. And I thought that doesn't sound very good either. So we just went with movement today. So we will be talking about how to incorporate a lot of movement into your storytelling while your backside has to stay on your stool. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about a little bit about how to go virtual if you have to do that um, with practices with your students, um, if you end up doing that for contest because we don't know what contest is going to look like yet. Uh, we thought we'd give you a few hints about storytelling in the virtual world because Darren has been doing that for the last six months. So that's what we have for you today. Um, we'll have some resources also to share with you at the end, but we are going to jump right in and let Darren start talking to you about personal storytelling. Take it away, Mr. Crow. Ooh, thank you, Mrs. Crow. You're welcome. <laughs> well, as speech coaches, uh, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time. Not so long for me. What, this is like, what, eight, nine years? This is the 10th year of our speech team. Oh, yay. yay. Um, so some of you have been doing this a lot longer than we have. Some of you a lot shorter. Um, and a lot of you are really great at producing terrific storytellers. Uh, I, I love sitting in the storytelling room at contest and at Allstate because I know I'm going to see amazing and really fun things, whether they be uh, children's stories from storybooks, whether they be folk tales or fairy tales. Um, I've just seen some really cool stuff. And one aspect I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, that can give you some variety is personal storytelling. Now, 
personal storytelling has been enjoying a huge amount of popularity over the last few years. If you're on NPR on a weekend, you can listen to the Moth Radio Hour or Snap Judgment. Certainly in the podcast world, there are you know, stacks of podcasts about personal storytelling. And there are groups all over the country, from the Madison Story Slam to uh, other, other story slams in, in big cities, where people will line up around the block to hear people tell five-minute stories about their life. Now, why should you consider doing a personal story? Well, for one thing, it can tie into your curriculum really well. You may already be doing personal story writing in some of the lit classes. I think it's uh, West Des Moines in seventh grade every year for the last several years has done a personal story writing unit. Um, with all that's been going on in 2020, yeah, we've all got stories to tell. And they can be fun, they can be therapeutic, they can help us figure things out. It's a good tool to use. Now, one other really handy thing with telling a personal story is you don't have to worry about copyright. There's no writing for permission because you're creating your own story. This is a great way for kids who really love to write, but maybe they don't run to write an original oratory or a long prose piece. This is a great outlet for them to try something. Uh, it's also a good outlet for your kid that loves to talk about themselves. And you know you've got them. This is a chance to give them an opportunity to share some of those stories and to really learn how to hone the stories well. Maybe to learn what stories we want to hear from you and what ones we don't want to hear from you. So there are some cool uh, opportunities there. Um, your personal stories, they can be silly. They can be heartwarming. They can be deeply serious and personal. Uh, they can be harrowing. We had a student a few years ago uh, who crafted a comedy horror story about the hotel we stayed in when we went to state speech one year. It was kind of cool. He ended up saying that there was a portal to hell under his bed in his hotel room. It was pretty hot in there, I've got to <laughs> say. It was pretty darn hot. Um, we have another kid who's working on a story this year uh, about life after the derecho when power was out and his story is gonna be about being accidentally Amish. It's kind of a cool idea. Um, your story can absolutely be on a serious topic. You, you could explore heavy things that have happened in your life. Now, Mrs. Crow, should it be therapy on stage? No, you want to share your story and let people feel that emotion with you, but you don't want it to be something that you are you know, doing therapy in front of an audience, that's not appropriate. But telling that story in a way, once you've processed and are able to share it, that can be a really, really powerful thing. And we've seen that done before in a really, really cool way. Yeah. So make sure you've processed through your emotions before you get them on stage, but they can be really cool. Uh, your story, it can have a deep meaning. It can have a message. There can be a lesson. And it can be a story that just gets told because it's a story that needs to get told, whether it's fun or whether it's serious. All right, so there are some things about personal story. Oh, one other thing, when we were looking at storytelling as a category, one thing we noticed in, 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 in the Constitution or the rule book or whichever thing it is we're looking at, in section six, judging criteria clause two, it says the role of the storyteller is primarily that of a narrator. And in a personal story, you really get to explore that narration. Uh, it's less focused maybe on character and more heavily focused on narration. So that can be kind of a cool thing. It also helps focus, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, if you're like me, one question I've asked myself for a long time when it comes to personal stories is, why would I want to do a personal story? Nobody wants to hear a story about me. I'm not very interesting. And so I avoided personal stories for a long time. If you're looking or trying to help your students look for a way to tell a personal story, one question to ask is, what's the story that everybody hears you telling them over and over again all the darn time until you're tired of hearing it? That's the personal story you should be telling. Have your kids go home, ask their friends and their family, what story do I constantly repeat? What one do I tell over and over again? In me and in, in my life, it was the story of Scott Kruger, gym class, 
flag football and the day I ended up stuck on the field in my underwear. It's a great story. It is a lot of fun. Um, another great place to mine for personal stories is family stories, because we all have stories that our families have told for generations and generations. Um, in my case, it happens to be that my family owns about 70 acres at the heart of Wall Street, and we've owned it since the 1600s. We just can't prove it anymore. <laughs> and so uh, that's a story I really like to tell. Now, when it comes to making that story and taking it from something that I tell my family all the time, how can we start crafting that story? Well, if you ask the student, tell me your story, you've got a basic structure there. But to help us really focus and hone it and craft it, one exciting method is to actually tell the story back to front. If you start with the ending and say, and that's how the story ends. And then ask yourself, what happens right before that? And then what happens right before that? And what happens right before that till you get back to the beginning? You can very quickly craft a focused story. It seems counterintuitive, but it helps you stay focused so you don't go off on rabbit trails that distract you from the plot itself, especially when we only have five minutes to tell a story. And we have a fabulous example for you. This is a wonderful little story we're actually going to read to you right now because it only takes a minute and a half. It is called The End by David, yep, David LaRochelle, sorry, um, is the author of this story. It's a wonderful little children's book and it does that exact thing. It tells a story from the end to the beginning. So we wanna share it with you so that you can kind of see what Darren is talking about here with making your story go backwards. So we practice this in front of the camera. We'll, we'll see if we can make it work well. So here we go. The end. And they all lived happily ever after. They lived happily ever after because... The soggy knight fell in love with the clever princess. The knight fell in love with the clever princess because... She poured a big bowl of lemonade on top of his head. She poured a bowl of lemonade on top of his head because... Because the knight's curly red beard was on fire. His curly beard was on fire because... He had been tickling a great green dragon. He had been tickling a great green dragon because... The dragon would not stop crying. The dragon would not stop crying because... 100 bunny rabbits had hopped into his cave and frightened him. 100 bunny rabbits had hopped into the dragon's cave because... Well, they were trying to escape from an enormous tomato rolling down the hill. An enormous tomato was rolling down the hill because... It had been hit by a flying teacup. It had been hit by a flying teacup because... Because a hungry giant was throwing a temper tantrum. And the giant was throwing a temper tantrum because... The cook did not make lemon cheesecake for dessert. The cook did not make lemon cheesecake for dessert because... There were no lemons. None left at the market. And there were no lemons left at the market because... Once upon a time, a clever princess decided to make a big bowl of lemonade. The beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one quick, very silly example of telling your story from end to beginning. But it is a really quick and handy way to organize the story and to help you stay focused on it. And Mr. Crow, you've actually done that writing your stories before, haven't you? I have. Yep. I I've worked both with myself and with students uh, focusing down a story that direction. Now, if you're going to tell a personal story, and you've only got five minutes, does your story have to happen factually, just exactly as it happened in life? Well, no. You may have to rearrange the order of events or condense the timeline in order to make the story fit into five minutes and to make it a good story. Um, it doesn't have to be completely factual in order to be true. Now, does that mean you get to make up a whole lot of events that never actually happened? No, unless, of course, you're telling your story and all of a sudden you think, oh, this could really get built upon and exaggerated and suddenly you're creating a personal tall tale, which could be an awful lot of fun. We have a storyteller we love named Bill Lepp 
who does that. And I use his tall tales in um, my lit classes, actually. We listen to it and then write our own tall tales as well. Um, and we've got his information at the end, but he takes great little nuggets of personal story and turns it into this ridiculous um, tall tale adventure and it's wonderful. So that's another area that you can look at and go with, with your kids. Yeah. Oh, and Mrs. Crow, since you are already standing there, and I've talked just about all I can about personal stories That's for the moment. <laughs> I think it's time for Mrs. Crow to tell us a little bit about how you can use your body effectively when all you've got is a stool that you have to sit on. Yes. So we're going to do this awkward thing that I hope does not give any of you vertigo, but we are in my classroom right now and we are going to turn sideways so I can back up by my wall, my door. You see my phone pouches behind me there. Um, so that you can see more of me as I sit here on this wonderful stool. So sorry if it's causing vertigo for you all. So, um, you know, we have to sit on a stool to tell stories. We have to keep the category separate from an acting category. So I think that's part of why we sit our readers on our stool. You can confirm that with Craig, but I think that's the case. Um, but when you're on the stool, there's a lot that you can do. Um, of course, first of all, one of the things Darren talked about is that the storytelling category really is a lot about narration. But even when you're narrating, you can move, right? You don't want to just sit there and stoically tell your story. You want to be more animated and move around, have some gestures and that as you're narrating. But even more important, when you create characters, you want to place those characters and have specific movement and posture for each of those characters to really well define them. For example, if I'm a little old lady, I might be over here with my cane and walking down the street. Or if I'm the hero, I might face this direction and talk like this and have my hands on my hips. So I've created those two characters. And if they talk to each other, you switch them back and forth. And then your narrator can be in the center. Now, um, you're sitting. But that doesn't mean you can't give us the appearance of movement. They can run down the hill or flail around or whatever the character needs to do to portray that character accurately or well, right? Um, storytellers are not very interesting if they just sit. You'd like to have some movement with that as well. Um, this is also a great way to help kids who get really nervous in their storytelling. I had a teller several years ago who told her story like this. She was doing her story, it was a serious story, and this was all she did the whole time. And we worked and we worked and we worked to give her some movement and some gestures um, so that she would not you know, wear out her jeans as she was practicing her story every day. When you do movement in your stories, you want it to look very natural. You don't want to choreograph your story so clearly because that seems contrived and forced. You want to go for as natural of movement as you possibly can. Now, it should be well practiced and well rehearsed and well choreographed so they know what they're doing where, um, but it should be pretty natural. Um, that's a really important part of storytelling. Now I have to look at my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. Oh, yes. Um, my dear husband, Darren, is a flailer. So sometimes when he tells stories, he is all over the place. And so he does have to work really hard at pulling things back sometimes, especially when we're virtual, which he'll talk about with you in just a few minutes. Um, now, big movement and lots of excitement can be really fun and exciting, but also very little movement can be really effective as well. Okay, so if you have a storyteller who is telling their story and you just get, you know, the leaning forward or the small little controlled movements that really emphasize what they're talking about, that can be very effective as well. But movement is a really important part of storytelling. Um, you got to keep that rear on the chair, um, cannot get up, but get some of that movement in there, those natural gestures for your students. Uh, to work on. One thing I also suggest, I know a stool is always provided by your host school, um, but we always bring our own because my students practice on it. They know where there are rungs. They know where they can balance themselves if they're going to be moving. Um, they know the height of the stool. They're familiar with that. Um, and you never really know what you're going to get at a host school. It might be really small. It might have rungs. It might not. So having a dedicated storytelling stool that your kids can consistently practice on will make them more and more and more comfortable as they continue to work on movement um, and body language as they're telling their stories. 
And I think that is, yes, pretty much what I wanted to say about movement, but something to really think about. And of course, again, if you have to go virtual, your movements are gonna to need to be a little bit bigger because you're going to need to be a little bit farther away so you can see the whole storyteller. So that's something to, to consider and think about as well. But that's my short little section on movement. Now we are going to move the computer back and talk to you just for a couple of minutes about um, doing virtual storytelling and how you can work that when you're practicing with your students, if you can't be with them in person. Um, and again, if we have to do virtual contest or if people choose to do virtual contest, this will give you a way to um, kind of have some ideas on how to make that work and be effective. So back to Mr. Crow. <laughs> Hello again. That was really cool, Mrs. Crow. Thank you. Um, we've all probably been on way too many Zoom meetings over the past six months, and um, we'll still be on quite a few more over the next several months. So I would imagine you've all seen a lot of this, but let me give you a few tips here as I've been looking. Um, one, jump in and play around in the settings because you can really change dramatically how your audio and visual works in a Zoom meeting by jumping in and playing with those settings a little bit. Um, just remember, either write down or take a picture of where the settings were when you started <laughs> and then where they are when you, you get them where you want them. Because if you're like me, then I'm not gonna remember where they were. Um, try to make sure that you get your, your computer or, or your camera up so that that, camera lens is just about at eye level or maybe even a little higher so that you're, you're not doing weird things like this or like this. Right now we have this set on the top of my standing desk in my classroom on top of three really thick books to get this up to eye level so that you're not, you know, looking at our double chins or up our noses. Um, do plenty of test runs because uh, I, I know when I'm working on, on a remote storytelling piece with an organization, one of the most important things to do is get on ahead of time and make sure everything's working right. And boy, if you can attach your computer or your camera to a, um, an ethernet cable to help make sure your internet connection is very steady, that's a very good thing because I've certainly had plenty that were not steady. Now let me see my friends. I think it's probably just about time to wrap up and yes. think about questions. I am gonna share with you real quickly again, our um, resources page. Here we go. This will be, Craig has this already. It will be on the website, the IHSSA website. So you can look at it. These are some fabulous storytellers. This is Bill Lepp, the first one um, that I was just talking about with his tall tales. Tim Lowry, uh, Donald Davis, Linda Gorham. These are people who are kind of royalty in the storytelling world. Um, yes, there is kind of such a thing. Um, I also put Darren Crow, his uh, website on here. I think he's royalty in the storytelling world. I'm just a little bit prejudiced. We've got, whoops, sorry. I don't know where it went. <laughs> ah, there it is. Okay, we've got some great stories that you can watch that give you some great examples of using your body well, of telling a great personal story. There's also down here at the bottom some links to storytelling units as well. So all of that will be available to you. And then finally, I just have our emails there as well. You can always email and ask us any kind of questions that you guys might have. If we can help you in any way, we certainly would be more than happy to do, do so. We love storytelling. Um, it's a great category. We'd love to see it continue to branch out more into personal stories and some of these other types of storytelling. So that is what we have. Like I said, it will be on the website for you to take a look at. So I'll stop our share and I don't have any idea if there are any questions or anything. So Tom, I'll let you jump in on that. Thanks Robin and thank you Robin and Darren for a wonderful presentation to kick us off here this afternoon. We have about five minutes for questions. So I do have one that was submitted in the Q&A. It is from Angie and the question is, is there a ratio of narration and character voices we should consider when writing our own personal story? No, I don't think there really is. Because, uh, a while while the you know the the the, the casebook uh, suggests that the role of the storyteller is primarily that of a narrator, so I guess you would say it shouldn't be primarily characters. 
if you're going to lean one direction, I would lean more toward narrative, but I don't think any judge is going to go, oh, you were 70% character there. That's a two. Yeah, hopefully not. And it does say in the clause, however, the speaker may assume the role of a character when involved in direct dialogue. In addition, the storyteller might assume a character role as a narrator. So you could tell the story as a little old woman, for example, and then she be the narrator. Um, so that is something, though, I think we don't pay enough attention to, that narration is really important in storytelling. Yay. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Angie says thank you. Um, let me pull up. We do have a few participants who have raised their hand to ask a question. And folks, I'll remind you, either submit a question through the Q&A function or you are welcome to raise your hand. Susan has raised her hand. Susan, I'm going to allow you to speak. Go ahead and unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, actually, I think I did that accidentally. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. That's okay, Susan. We still like but you. But this is great. <laughs> <laughs> and Angie, I believe you have your hand raised as well. You can now unmute yourself if you have a comment to make. Oh, that was an accident. No worries. I didn't mean to raise my hand. I'm sorry. I was playing with my raising my hand mode. I haven't done that before. So thank you for answering my question. You guys are very engaging. So thank you. Thanks, Angie. <laughs> Okay, well, at this time, we do not have any other questions submitted. Uh, we do have a comment that was submitted. It says, thanks for the focus on personal stories, a great focus to bring back more into the IHSSA. That's from an anonymous attendee. Great. Yeah, we think it's a, it's a great category that's kind of underutilized. And like I said, over the years, we've seen some fantastic personal stories, serious ones and funny ones. Um, and we'd love more of that, especially I think it'd be a great way for kids to share their experiences of 2020. If you're in, we're in the path of the derecho, that part of Iowa, there's a lot of stories that can be told there. Um, just all kinds of great stuff. So have fun with it. Thanks. Robin and Darren, I have a question that I think a lot of people wonder about when they're doing storytelling is, I'm working with a brand new storyteller who is very apprehensive. How, what are some of the tips that you do to get young people to come out of their shell a little bit and be that wonderful storyteller. What are some things, the little magic nuggets that you do that could help some of our coaches? Well, you know, what, one great way to get comfortable with a story is to try different ways of telling the story. And you know, one thing really, we really work on with our kids is getting them comfortable with the idea that a story is frequently told and, and not necessarily memorized. And by the time you've told the story three or four different ways, you're starting to get comfortable with it. And even a memorized piece, um, if as you're working on learning it, we can start telling the story so that we're comfortable with it, um, that, that, that's a good way to start loosening up. We'll have, we had one student I'm thinking of in particular, just real quickly, who he'd come in to work with us in junior high, because we have a junior high speech team as well in our conference. And we, okay, tell us the story. There was this guy, he went to dinner, and then he died. Okay, tell us the story again with a little bit more detail and get him to tell it a little bit more detail each time, you know, and read it and read it and read it and get more familiar. And then just keep working on telling us that story in his own words. And then it becomes, it became a really cool piece that he did a really good job with. Great. Well, thank you so much for kicking off our second day of Coaches Convention U2. You're amazing. It was wonderful to have you with us. And now, just like Amazon Prime Day, we got more deals for you all. <laughs> and we have Allison Rasmussen, who's an instructional coach at Waverly Shell Rock. She's taught in three different districts. Uh, positions raising, uh, raising from fourth grade teacher to K-12 music to speech. But in every school district she was in, she was a speech coach. And Allison's here to remind us to be kind to ourselves and to give some self-care tips that we face in this unique year and to get us in the swing of things. And Allison, boy, do we need this now. I was so looking forward to some of the tips that you're gonna give us. So Allison Rasmussen from Waverly Shell Rock, take it away. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for the opportunity to share this. This just happens to be a big passion of mine. 
and it is um, a hill that I am willing as an instructional coach to die on. So let me get my shared. Great. So um, I'm not quite technologically savvy enough, even after the months and months and months we've had on Zoom, to make sure that I can see myself and all of you. So I'm just going to hope that I don't pick my nose in front of you and we're going to go from there. So, all right. So what we're going to try to do tonight is 30 minutes or self, a few self-care tips in 30 minutes or less. All right. And we're going. All right. So uh, things we're going to cover, we're going to talk about why it's so important, got a little bit of the research about it, and then um, how you can start today with small steps to make yourself uh, better and work better well-being. So um, I promise not to do a lot of slide karaoke, but there are a couple things that I will read out loud to you, and this is one of them. If you want to know what a person values, watch how they spend their money and how they spend their time. So that being said, do you value you? So let's take ourselves, take a moment to value ourselves, all right? So breathe for a stinking moment. So gently tip your head side to side. And if your head doesn't move that way, you might need to see a masseuse or a chiropractor. And then raise your shoulders up and down. And maybe the other way. If your arms are tingling, that means the blood is flowing back to them, which is also maybe a sign for a massage or a chiropractor. Um, and then for a moment, just think about something that went really well today or something that in general that you are grateful for. Because gratitude is like the biggest key to happiness and a huge piece of well-being and self-care. All right, take, take one more deep breath in. All right, I'm gonna talk really fast, so let's do this. So why is self-care so important? If you look at the pictures of the brain on the other side of the screen, you can see the difference between a normal brain and a brain that has PTSD or has been abused. It's been proven that the amount of stress that we have kills off those same portions of our brain. So if y'all are like me and are starting to get into the memory fund, um, it's so important to be able to keep all of the parts of our brain working all the time. And we know, especially right now, if we're trying to do double duty or triple duty by doing in school teaching and out of school teaching and hybrid and holy moly, all of this stuff, there is definitely a whole layer of stress plus the secondary traumatic stress that comes from just being a teacher and carrying the load of our students because we love them so much. Okay, so have, having some self-care is also wicked important to your body, right? You need to make sure because your body doesn't function real well if you've got high blood pressure. It can cause differences in your digestional system, including nausea and diarrhea. And the worst part about it, especially right now, considering we're in the time of COVID, is frequent colds or flu, right? I don't know how many of you have had the COVID test where it goes up and kind of swabs your brain. It's delightful. We always get to go out for donuts after we get a hurts or a hurts donut when we get a COVID test in our house. But who wants to do that? Keep your body healthy so that you can stay safe and stress, a little less stress and stay in school. All right, so why else is self-care self so important? Holy moly, everybody who is on here is a speech coach. That means you already have a side hustle, right? We all have our full-time teaching jobs or whatever jobs it is that you bring yourself to that speech, speech practices when you're at the end of the day, right? So you're already amping up that piece. So we need to take even better care of yourself because if you don't, you're not gonna have enough to give to anybody. And like it says, busy is not a badge of honor. It is not something that we should strive for. We should not strive to pack every single moment of our day. We get to a point what's called surge capacity and that's where all of our nervous system and our body and everything else just shuts down and we have to do things. All right, so when we think about our brains as well, we need to think about kind of what triggers us. What is the big piece of stress that, that makes us the most crazy, right? So when we talk about the hand model of the brain, we've got the amygdala and the hippocampus and then our prefrontal cortex, right? And so if you've got a kid who ticks you off or pushes your buttons, you flip your lid, that means you can't do any of the normal regular thinking that you should be doing, let alone try to do all of the busyness that you have to do. So being able to keep your lid down and having the, yourself be healthy, self-care is the new health care. So you really need to concentrate on your well-being. The other side of that, we all are working with kids all the time. So modeling that self-care and self-compassion 
is gigantic. If these, they see you doing it and they say, we're, you say to them, we're going to stop practice at this time because my sleep is very important to me. That's going to give them that a huge background into how, what you really value. So there's a whole bunch of research um, through Harvard University. I got through this information from Dr. Clay Cook, who's out of the University of Minnesota, when he talks about sleep. Folks, if there is one magic wand I could put over the entire community in the world, it would be for everybody to get eight hours of sleep. It is amazing what can do for your, your mood, your body, um, your thinking ability with the amount of sleep that you get. So that's gigantic. Um, when we lose sleep, we get less effective. So between sleep and exercise, those two are enough mood boosting um, components alone that you really, I mean, I've talked with people and I know that that's been medically proven that if you increase your, uh, your sleep and your exercise, um, it's going to do better things for your mental health. There haven't been large studies about this because no one takes time to do it. We specifically, um, as Americans and as teachers, we just, we thrive on running a thousand miles an hour. And I'm gonna beg you at this juncture to just stop. So here's my other slide, karaoke. We need to do a better job putting ourselves at the top of our own to-do lists. As concrete sequential as we all are, I know we have to-do lists. And making sure that we put ourselves at the top is gonna make everything at the bottom make way more sense. All right, so five tips on how to start today. Trim your list, allow yourself to stop, embrace vulnerability, reach out to experts, and pass your umbrella. All right, so when we talk about number one, trim your list. Like interventions when we do in school, um, you can only do one thing at a time to make it really work, right? So if there are a gazillion things that you're trying to get done, make a list of things in priority. What you think is the most important, pick the top three, Okay, so slide out all the rest of that. Trust me, it will get done eventually, if not by you, by somebody else who's more willing to pick up that stuff. So once you get your top three, hit that one and hit it as hard as you possibly can. And that way you are using 95% of your energy on the thing that is most important. I currently am on a um, year long journey of saying no. no. Um, I, uh, I have a therapist, I have two actually, fun. Um, but one of them said, Allison, you need to take a year of no. All those people have a year of yes, you need a year of no, because you're an uber achiever, blah, blah, blah. Like we all are, because that's how we roll when we are speech coaches and teachers and parents and all of those things, right? So I had to put myself in half a little flow chart. So it comes down to, um, is there a should attached to it, which means there's kind of a back level of guilt, right? And is it more than one and done? So like, is it, am I committing to a whole bunch of time or is it just a one thing? So I go through those questions and then do you want to do it? And then it filters through, does it fit my values? Do I have time? And if it's not a hell yes, it's a no thank you. And that has been such a saving grace to me. And I know that there are times specifically in our jobs that we might get um, voluntold to do something that we don't get a chance to go through the flowchart. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you can hook your values to that, that's going to make that job, even that you didn't necessarily sign up for, a little easier. Uh, my favorite bit of this uh, was at the beginning of COVID, I had a friend of mine say that she was really relieved that she didn't have to go to a meeting when the first quarantining round came around. And she then went on to say, I wonder if I should be going to that meeting to begin with, if you were not that excited about it. And that was another thing that I really um, kind of focused on. All right, so number two, you have to allow and make time, allow your time to stop, right? This is a good time. All of the underlying things um, are links. Uh, my PowerPoint is, or the slide deck is on the website, as well as an entire note sheet because I hate busy PowerPoints and there, there was just too much information to slam in there. So um, when you get a chance to follow along, there's way more information and documentation. But for right now, let's talk about allowing yourself to stop. So on that sheet, there's a time audit with 30 minute slots, right? Write down your day, people. I'm telling you, it can be very scary because you actually watch yourself like, oh, I am scrolling Facebook mindlessly for 
a half an hour during my lunch hour instead of maybe going for a walk. And I know some of you are saying right now, who gets lunch hour? And friends, I understand. So that's another time too. When you look and analyze your time, find time for you. So wicked important, right? Um, also, if you can find that time, even if it's 10 minutes, go for a walk, right? Uh, there's, I think underneath there, there's links to all sorts of different things. Um, one is another, or, or dance or sing. There's karaoke, all of those things. Do something that fills your soul, right? I cannot say enough about what water can do for you. It's like sleep, exercise, water. This is the happy water bottle that I use every day. Do I get to the bottom of it? Not always, but that's my goal, right? Am I going to the bathroom all the time? Depends on the day actually, because the amount of water that I need and that everybody needs to kind of keep their body flowing and going, sometimes you absorb more and you don't, anyway. That's more biology than we want to get into. I'm telling you, friends, allow your time to find a place to stop. Three, embrace vulnerability. I am a huge Brene Brown fan. She's the vulnerability queen. And using her, the underlying piece here, which is also linked in the notes, is a place that says using your values to drive what you do. Uh, underlined there, you can go to um, uh, an exercise that Brene has put out about really digging in and finding your own values and what that means to you. So when you are able to have that that backbone, the the um, the two stamps to stand on when it comes to knowing yourself and knowing what you want to do, that is an amazing piece of self care because. Like the flow chart, if it doesn't fit into those values, maybe it's not something that you should be doing, right? And going all the way down to the bottom, we need to accept the fact that it's okay not to be okay, right? We never do that for ourselves. I, I was raised in a house where um, sitting down was laziness and admitting you had a problem was, um, you were sick. It was just unheard of, right? Currently, if I don't take some mental health time and I tell, I tell my story all the time to whoever will listen to me. Um, I had a wicked bout of anxiety and depression right as COVID starting. Um, there was a shame spiral and it was a mess. So, and it took me a little while to dig out of that and say, you know what? I'm not okay and I need help. So I would encourage you to embrace your vulnerability and get help when you need to. All right, reach out to the ex experts. I'm gonna tell you right now, this girl, not an expert. All of the things I'm sharing from you are gleaned from all of the rest of really brilliant people in the entire world. A few of them are on this list, a whole bunch of them are on the notes. So if you're looking for a voice in the wilderness, there's lots of options there. Um, a quote that I got when we talk about uh, reaching out to experts or people that know more than you do, you can pretend and fail or ask and succeed. So I look to these people to help give me inspiration and tips and just the background knowledge to know and give me more motivation like there shouldn't need to be, but I need more motivation to take care of myself, right? So um, a handful of people that are in the tops of my favorite list, there are bunches and bunches and bunches. And I'm um, going to say to you the same way that you, I'm gonna flip back to trim your list don't try to listen to everybody. At the beginning of COVID, I was in, in this in this shame spiral and all of the ridiculousness. I was reaching out to everybody. I was listening to three podcasts and writing two journals and looking at all this. And then at the same time, of course, you're looking at all of the testing results and all the crazy politics. And it's just like, Wah! so trim your list and find your voice in the wilderness. Currently, um, my big four are Dr. Clay Cook at the University of Minnesota. He is a brilliant educational psychologist. He works side by side with an organization called Character Strong. They do lots and lots and lots of wonderful free webinars about social emotional learning as well as adult self-care. Brilliant. Um, the next, uh, the next three kind of fall into this, into the same flavor. Brene Brown, of course, the Queen of Vulnerability. Her podcasts are amazing, and she's starting a new one based specifically on the Her Dare to Lead book. Tina Bogren is, uh, works with uh, um, 
Oh, that, the, this, the something tree. Anyway, she works with Dr. Marzano out in Colorado. And she has made a couple of um, self-care books specifically for teachers and educators. So I would highly recommend her. And if you're really ready for a deep dive into self-care, you need to look up Alana Aguilar. She's written a book called um, Onward, and it's based on teacher's resilience. She um, has done a handful of art, the art of coaching and the art of coaching equity. There are, she's just done some really good and hard, deep work on working with teachers on really getting to their core and building their resilience. But like I said, make sure that you're curating your favorites, find those voices. There are lots of great ones, so but you're gonna wanna get to a list. Um, on, again, on the note sheet, there's a bunch of them for you to filter through. Um, so take a little time to go to a buffet of self-care and figure out the, which, the ones that you like the best. All right, this one might be the hardest one for our happy control freak speech family to muster, but you have to be able to pass your umbrella. In other words, you don't have to do it all by yourself, right? You don't. Um, when you think about it, I had an administrator tell me one time, you need to write down all of the things that you do as a teacher that take your degree. And then all of the things that you do as a teacher that don't take your degree. Do your best to farm those out, right? So that you can concentrate and work on the really good and important stuff. I know not all of you, because I was in a position for a long time as a speech coach, not all of you are lucky enough to have an assistant, right? Grab a kid, you know, lean then into that leadership because there isn't any reason that those kids can't get involved in fostering younger students or help running rehearsals and those kinds of things. I understand that we all have different, um, administrations that we have to work with and different criteria that we have to follow that oh my gosh I can't Alice and I can't let a student leave that if I'm not here who says you don't have to be there you can be in the room checking the papers and they can be doing their thing and I know that's wicked hard but I'm just saying people find ways that you can pass your umbrella my favorite thing the Brene Brown uh, talks about in one of her podcasts or in her book um, she talks about like her family she has a boy and a girl and her husband and they, they consider themselves in quadrants. But so when all of them are at full capacity, everybody's at 25%. Now, most of the time, at least in my family, I have two stepchildren that live with us every other day or every other week. So they're plus and minus into the percentage um, of energy in our family sometimes fluctuates when they're here and when they're not. But I can tell you flat out when, at, when we were in, um, uh, March and April and May before I had been able to put myself back together I flat out said to my husband I'm like Ray I'm at zero there's I I literally have nothing to give right now to our family so I'm gonna have to have you help make me up help get to a place where we can get back to a hundred all right so there's my top five right trim your list allow yourself to stop embrace vulnerability reach out to experts and pass your umbrella, right? Do the best you can, and sorry, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, you'll do better. All right, so here's a whole bunch of that other stuff, um, which again, you're gonna, on the website is a copy of the slide deck as well as a whole big page of notes. Um, the one thing that's new on this slide deck uh, that I didn't get a chance because you know, we're always in, um, we're always reviewing and rewriting until we get to the very last minute, right? Who doesn't make a cut before the more night goes on stage in five minutes, right? Anyway, so the bottom of this page um, is Lucas Rockwood and it's called Change Your Breath, Change Your Life. It's very entertaining, not something you should necessarily share with students, but it is a great way to think about breath and how it can really make big changes for you. All right, I was, how was my timer? I don't get to see if I'm under my timer or if I'm over my time, Craig. You're so, under time, Allison. That was fantastic. Woo! All Thank right. So, so if you've got questions, we can do that real quick. Again, um, if you want to scribble the bit.ly down, you can. If not, um, all of the notes and all of the stuff is on the website. 
Well, thank you, Allison. Very, very important topic. Thank you for, for sharing your insights and, and a great presentation. Um, I know you shared quite a few authors. Um, there was one question or comment that came in regarding Shonda Rhimes and, and a book that she has. Uh, I know you shared other, other books as well. Are there specific um, other authors that you didn't mention that you would recommend? Ooh. Um, all right, so here's my prescription. If you are just thinking about, man, I would just like to take a baby step into this whole self-care well-being thing. I highly recommend Tina Bogren's book, um, Take Time for You, Self-Care for Educators. She bases the majority of her research on Maslow's hierarchy. So it starts from the bottom up and starts from just making sure you've got your physiological needs met. One of my favorite tools that she taught me was actually setting a timer on your watch or your phone or your calendar stuff to remind you to drink water or even breathe. Like um, at, I have one set for 10 o'clock every day. And sometimes I honor it and I do it like I'm supposed to, but sometimes if I'm in the middle of the meeting, I know I shouldn't, but I just kind of skip that because you have to give yourself grace. Self-care and well-being is not a perfection game, friends. It is all about just making yourself feel better because when you feel better, you do better, you're calmer, you're nicer, everybody likes you more and who doesn't like to be liked more, right? So skinny dive, Tina Bogren deep dive um onward it's just it, it comes it doesn't come with you can buy the book but then you can also buy this workbook that's over 300 pages which is a little intimidating but there are activities for every day to really and they're not long activities every day we're talking about maybe and it's so sad it's not long activities every day it takes five minutes a day who wouldn't want to get five minutes a day those bells who has five minutes a day to give right but carving out that chunk of time for you i'm telling you it's magic and i will again say not the expert just read a lot of stuff like to talk about it because it's so important that we take care of ourselves because we are the caregivers to the world right we all have these kids i'm in the middle of <laughs> i don't know how this crazy happened but I'm in the middle of trying to produce newsies during COVID. It's so fun. But the blessing of all of that is the kids are just so excited to be there that we all talk about making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Because if you can model that for kids, think about how much better they are gonna be in the meantime. And um, I just watched another TED talk on sleep the other day. And he's got a book, which is somewhere over here in this pile. Um, but it talked about how when you, whoever decided that pulling an all-nighter was a great way to study was a fool. Because even if you can't make up that sleep time and it damages more memory than it creates for you when you're learning. So gosh, friends, sleep, sleep, sleep. So skinny dive, Tina Bogren, deep dive onward. Those are my, t uh, those are would be my two go-tos. If awesome. you're talking about serious self-care and resilience. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, next question is still on the topic of sources and experts. Um, what kind of recommendations can you have for sources that are more strategies focused for, for girls or for boys or for adults versus children in general? What kind of differentiation in sources can you provide? Um, okay. So there are a boatload of female empowered authors out there right now, you know, starting with Queen Bee with our, our girlfriend, Brene. Um, Glennon Doyle's work is exceptional. Um, and I would even say that's good for um, like teenage girls even as well, because you're she does just a great job of trying to pull the bullshit, sorry, away from all of the expectations that we have for each other um young men okay so for young men men in general um if you want to take a little bit more of a um male is not the right word but it's a little bit more of a scientific look at another way that you can really dig in and embrace your vulnerability is to start talking about your feelings right and people get really jumpy when we start talking about our feelings um dr mark brackett 
out of Yale University um, has a book out currently called Permission to Feel. And he has a, um, it's a matrix in the front and back of his book. It's called the mood meter. And I know the word mood wrinkles people sometimes, um, but it's actually four squares of, of on the parallel this way, it's um, pleasant or unpleasant, and then it's high energy or low energy. And then, so looking at that and trying to figure out like, um, he says, Mark Brackett says something like, name it to tame it. So being able to say what exactly that you're feeling, even if you can't get to the exact word, is going to be able to have you be able to put that in one place. And when you can name it, you can say it, you can get away from all the catastrophizing that goes around with feeling that bad and step back and kind of analyze and say, oh, okay, this is because of this. So there's a little bit more rational behind that. Um, he does have a school-based program called Ruler. Unfortunately, it's a little expensive. So I would dive into anything that's called Mood Meter. There's actually an app that I use a lot and I love. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm that mom. I created a Mood Meter and we had it on our uh, pantry door where we sit for dinner every night. And if we would get to a spot, I'm like, okay, where are you on the Mood Meter? I know my kids are going to be in therapy, but they might already be. Anyway, um, so I highly recommend Mark Brackett, Mood Meter. That's a, that's a really good kind of scientific or more dissecty kind of place to look for well-being when you're talking about getting over the feely feelies with men. That was really stereotypical and I apologize, but that's what I got for you. No worries, thank you for sharing. Um, at this time, to be respectful of everyone's time, we, there are no additional questions that have been submitted. So thank you, Allison, for a great presentation. Um, at this time, I wanna turn it over back to Craig Enan. Well, thank you, Allison, and wonderful, wonderful tips for us as we head into speech season. And we are gonna have speech season. So get ready for that November 11th announcement when we're going to talk about what speech season will be. However, I want to remind you on October 28th, we're going to do another one of these. And in that time, we'll have mime and short film. And they're going to have some wonderful tips, just like Robin and Darren and Allison had for all of us today. And so we look forward to you being a part of that on the 28th. Encourage others to sign up. All the information, the slide decks, the PowerPoints, the notes are all on the website. They're on the link that says Coaches Convention Presentations. And as Tom said earlier, this entire presentation is being recorded and will be posted later this week or early next week. And with that, Tom, is there anything else we need to say? No, thank you all for being here.